We use the word joy, but uh, the realization, you know, that he is back on flying status and has a mission, and uh, there's no doubt about it, but what you can sense, he's very happy about this. It's important to me to, uh, to do this because of the self-satisfaction involved. I think everyone needs this sort of thing. This is a CBS News special report. Ten years later, the flight of Apollo 14. This evening, a brief look ahead at the next ten days in space and the profile of Alan Shepard. Reporting from CBS News headquarters at the Kennedy Space Center, correspondent Walter Cronkite. Good evening from the Kennedy Space Center. Apollo 14 marks a renewal of this country's program to explore the moon and a personal comeback for its commander. Despite a happy ending, Apollo 13 was a setback for moon exploration. Now Apollo 14 will try to do what 13 did not. The landing site is the same near the Frau Morrow crater in rough terrain believed of much older material than that brought back by the first two moon explorations. Again, two long moon walks are planned and most of the experiments are the same as those scheduled for 13. The main differences, new onboard safety devices and extra supplies are in direct response to the Apollo 13 explosion and the long perilous voyage home in its lunar module lifeboat. The Apollo 14 crew, which departs from here Sunday afternoon, will be commanded by 47-year-old Alan Shepard, the least experienced of space veterans. His teammates will be two space rookies, 40-year-old Edgar Mitchell, who will accompany Shepard to the moon surface, and Stuart Rusev, 37, who will remain aloft in the command ship. But the crew's story centers on Shepard. On May 5, 1961, inside his tiny Freedom 7, he became the first American to venture into space, a suborbital sprint downrange from Cape Kennedy. In the decades since then, Shepard has suffered illness and frustration, but all the while his attitude has been marked by drive, determination, and care to the last detail. Shepard's first space vehicle was a one-man Mercury capsule boosted aloft by a slim little redstone rocket. His flight lasted only 15 minutes and covered 300 miles. Looking back, Shepard recalls not the drama, but the details. There are two things, basically, uh, that uh, struck me, uh, as I recall, and, and then and still do now. One is the fact that uh, I expected a lot more vibration from the launch rocket than we got in those days. Uh, uh, it was a lot smoother ride, at least the power portion of the flight was a lot smoother than I had expected. And, uh, and secondly, uh, I think the fact that I was able to uh, to act and talk rationally during the short period of weightlessness that occurred was a, was a, quite a satisfaction to me because perhaps you may remember back in those days there were a number of cynics that, that felt that the person wouldn't be rational after five minutes of weightlessness. The first American in space became an instant hero. But disappointment was not far behind. An ear disorder impaired Shepard's hearing and balance and left him assigned to a space program desk job. This gave Shepard time to go into business, banking and real estate, which soon earned him a fortune. But business interests were not enough. Alan Shepard wanted to fly in space again. To do this would take time, and he determined to stay in shape. That determination is described by Richard Minns, who ran a health club where Shepard worked out. Uh, he's not a typical human uh, being. He's, uh, uh, he's, he's a super person. He's a super guy. Uh, he's a super person mentally, intellectually, uh, and physically, and uh, maintains that status uh, uh, through a standpoint of pride and uh, uh, ego. And when he comes in for his uh, exercise routine and his workouts, he stays with his exercise routine, he stays with the workout, because I think that to him is sort of a religion. It's something that he has to do. Uh, it's, a, it's a preventative medicine. Uh, it's uh, uh, a medicine to uh, 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 protect him against the aging uh, process. Shepard kept up his space program activities, but the ear problem remained until he heard about a doctor who had developed an operation for his condition, although success was not guaranteed. Shepard took the chance, had the operation in 1968, and was reactivated for space flight by Dr. Charles Berry, the astronaut's physician. No, I don't think anyone can question Al's uh, uh, tremendous motivation to do this mission. Uh, he, uh, he 
if, if I can just quickly re review the kind of things that happened, you know that uh, Al was selected uh, initially to fly the, the initial uh, mission in, in uh, Mercury, and uh, he was selected because of some qualities which he, uh, which he exhibits, which really, he's a very self-sufficient ind individual. He's very self-contained and, and extremely self-sufficient in that regard, and I think that was something that was very badly needed in that first kind of a mission. Interestingly enough, he's been able to, to, to take that same personality and to deal with it in a team concept to where he has three people involved and not just himself as, a, as an individual. He would like to have flown in, in the early Gemini, the first Gemini mission, or early Gemini mission anyway, and unfortunately he had this many years uh, develop uh, prior to that time, and then uh, we had to ground him. Now, he maintained a motivation to fly during all of that period of time. Uh, he has been steadfast in that. He, he has wanted to do it. He's been goal-directed that way. If there's any alley that is goal-directed. Shepard's dedication did not always make him an easy man to like. One of his best friends, Deke Slayton, boss of the astronauts, says Shepard had his troubles making friends. I don't think he's the... Uh type of individual that probably takes to people and develops a close friendship on a short notice. He's not, uh, well, if you're going to try to compare him with people in the original seven, for example, you had uh, John Glenn and Wally Shira, who were both great extroverts and uh, just an entirely different kind of personality. Al's not that type of personality. The last word on Alan Shepard is determination and dedication belongs to the men who train long and hard with him and will fly with him on Apollo 14. First Stuart Rusev, then Edgar Mitchell. Yeah, I think there's something different about Al. He's probably one of the uh, most talented people in, in our business that, uh, that I've come across, you know. He's, a, he's extremely uh, uh, cool and, and, and from a flying standpoint, you know, it, and he's always right to the heart of the problem. Al has a responsibility for the overall success of this mission as far as the crew is concerned. He exercises it well, but he allows Stu and I to do our jobs and do them to the best of our ability. And so uh, I haven't seen any temperament that you talk about. Not only was his last space flight 10 years ago, but at 47, Alan Shepard is America's oldest active astronaut. David Shoemaker talked with him about his age and his long grounding. The joke we heard when we came down here was that uh, the command module was named Kitty Hawk in honor of your first mission. Are you getting a little tired about all this talk about your age? Well, you know, the long gray beard does get in my way once in a while. Uh, I don't know, I guess it's pretty hard to avoid that kind of talk. It's no secret that I am uh, that old. And uh, it does... Uh, it gets a little unnerving to have to be forced to think about it uh, from time to time. I, normally, when I'm not talking to reporters, I don't think about my age. <laughs> have you been, uh, let's say, uh, a bear as a result of being grounded? I wonder, you know, how you've been to live with. No, I think, uh, I think, during the grounding period, I found other things uh, in the space program to occupy my attention. So that wasn't a difficult time for you. I didn't say that. What would you say? It was difficult for me, uh, for example, on the Gemini days when I was uh, along with Deke Slayton, we used to alternate as directors of each of these respective flight crews to be with a crew during the uh, final stages of their training and, uh, and help them with their policy making decisions and these kind of things and, uh, and take them down and uh, get them suited up and take them to the launch pad and then watch them go away. These, they sure have been difficult times. We've talked to some people who have likened you to, to a superman and uh, Others who have said, uh, you're determined never to grow old. And others who have said, whatever you're assigned to do, whatever it may be, you can do it. And others who have said, you, you don't like people very well, you don't need them very well. What, what really is there about you, do you think? Who are you? Well, I, who am I to decide? I don't know. You know, a person can't analyze himself. 
Uh, it's important to me to, uh, to do this because of the self-satisfaction involved. I think everyone needs this sort of thing. And I suppose that's really who I am, an individual who, who likes to make a contribution to his country because he knows he can with a certain level of confidence. Perhaps that's the easiest way of putting it. Former astronaut Walter Sherraw is with us again on the flight of Apollo 14. And Wally, you and Alan Shepard were part of the original seven Mercury astronauts. I wonder what your strongest impression of Alan is. Well, I think without doubt it's the, the cold, fishy-eyed look that you get when you first meet Al. Then, of course, you realize that he is a cool customer. But with time, you realize he's also a very warm, sensitive fellow, but a, a great leader. And this is, uh, I guess, the best impression I could give anybody. I remember in those early days of Mercury down here at the Cape, uh, Alan was as much of a fun lover, one of the boys, as anybody else. Some of the pieces that have been coming out lately, the stories from Houston have suggested he's aloof, uh, unfriendly, cold, as you mentioned. I think perhaps that's because of the job he had. He, in these 10 years, has been assigning the astronauts to the flights and the jobs and supervising them, and that doesn't lend toward friendliness. That's the that's the chill of command, isn't it? It is very much that. In fact, uh, I guess you can say that uh, we all felt that. Uh, each one of us, really from a guts feeling, would admit to being something of a prima donna because we're, we're focused on so, so often. And uh, someone has to be a super prima donna, and Al had to be that. He had to give the orders. The younger ones who didn't have the responsibility or the experience didn't take that too well, I suppose. You know, speaking of being prima donnas, uh, the seven Mercury astronauts have always been considered something rather special. Do you think that there's something special about you seven? Well, the only thing I would concede in that sense is that uh, we were all small town guys, average fellows. Uh, most were the senior child, if not the only child. But the, uh, the uniqueness really was the, the sense of pioneering. We were doing something that no one else really wanted to do, it turned out. Uh, at least our contemporaries, a number of test pilots would say, what are you going to get in that can for? Well, that's sort of the specialist I might at least exceed to. And you're all very close, aren't you? We are. We're just all seven brothers is what I'd call it. Wally Shira and I and the rest of the CBS News space team will bring you the highlights of this Apollo 14 mission starting with Sunday's launch. That broadcast begins at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. You can also see live and for the first time in color the two moonwalks on Friday and Saturday mornings and we'll be on hand, of course, for the splashdown Tuesday afternoon, February 9th. This is Walter Cronkite, CBS News, Kennedy Space Center. Good night. The Apollo 14 moon mission is ready to go at an estimated cost of $400 million, which is $25 million more than was spent on last spring's Apollo 13. With blast-off scheduled for tomorrow, we have a report tonight from Walter Cronkite and former astronaut Wally Shira at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Well, it seems to me it's got all the feel of a football Saturday here at the Cape. The weather is perfect, the cloudless skies, temperature in the mid-70s, and a football crowd attitude in Cocoa Beach, too. There's all this talk, of course, that space flight trips to the moon, if you please, are boring the American people. Well, a half million of them have come here to crowd into this corner of Florida this weekend to watch the launch of Apollo 14. And the European Broadcasting Union says that 600 million people around the world are going to be watching on television. Here the guest list includes American officialdom and European, Hollywood, and industrial royalty. Vice President Agnew, Spain's ruler designate, young Prince Juan Carlos and his princess, Bob Hope, Kirk Douglas, Cary Grant, the president of General Motors, the president of the Steelworkers Union, a Kansas City optics tycoon chartered a jumbo jet to bring his friends here, including 30 millionaires and three Middle Western governors. And of course, uh, of all the distinguished guests here, the wives and the children of the astronauts, but so careful is NASA that these flyers don't repeat the measles debacle of Apollo 13, that visits have about all the charm of a Saturday afternoon at Sing Sing through a plate glass window. There's some interest in this flight at any rate, it seems, no matter how bored some may be. As a matter of fact, Wally, the spectacle aspect seems to me to overlay an atmosphere of almost unprecedented calm here at the Cape among space people. 
Well, I, I felt that. It's, it's almost an eerie feeling. We, we, we normally would expect to have some tank wouldn't fuel right, or some system wouldn't check out right, or we'd have a lightning storm, but everything is going uh, just nominal is the good word, and I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, there was a little glitch in the power this afternoon that gave them some worry. Uh, the, the power dropped out. They thought the computers might have been affected, but it turned out they weren't. Everything's fine. Everything's go. The astronauts are in good shape. The spacecraft in good shape. A little uh, cold front coming down from the north that might get a weather problem tomorrow, but they say it looks like it's going to be okay for liftoff at 3.23 tomorrow afternoon, Eastern Time. Roger.